Joining me now from Sydney is the former Labor advisor now with Fitzpatrick Advisory, Evan Fitzpatrick, and in Canberra, the former Liberal advisor now with DPG Advisory, David Gazar. Gentlemen, thanks both for your time. I might just start the program with uh, what we heard from Michael Suker yesterday. Uh, this is in response to obviously very early fire season uh, and what sort of factor climate change is. Pretty unseasonally hot weather in New South Wales and Queensland at the moment and the prospect of fires on the south coast of New South Wales. Do you think climate change is a contributor to that? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think you can say that climate change itself for any particular season, any particular event. Australia has um, always um, been a land of uh, fires and flooding rains. That has been time immemorial. So starting with you on this David, it's true that you never say this one event, this heat wave has ever attributed to climate change but given, I mean we had earlier this year that the hottest day on record overall and now we're getting the next sort of blast of heat is this going to start wearing a bit thin for voters? That, that sort of logical reasoning but one that sort of tries to push climate change to the side? Well, everyone seems to measure these things on based on their life experience. And, uh, you know, voters these days think it's the hottest day on record or the hottest spring on record or, you know, if it's unseasonably cold, it's all climate change. So whatever the case, we've had a lot of rain over the last three years. Uh, it's going to dry out. And, you know, I, I expect there's going to be a lot more warnings about the risk of fire danger going forward. and. Inevitably, uh, people will use that to, to say that we're the nation's in peril because of climate change. So w whether, whether, you know, I mean, there's a, a large body of evidence that shows that we're, we're warming and, you know, but, but whether you can tell that from an unseasonably hot period over no, the not last from one, three but days. The yeah. large body of evidence, I guess, is the trickier part, that you can yeah. sort of go, well, we'd never know what individual element is, but is that still what voters want to hear is, is, is the question? Yeah, uh, every time you have one of these things, it's obviously going to spark the debate and that's going to feed into uh, a, a variety of views and that, 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 will, that will mean that the climate debate kicks along and alternate forms of power and so on, generation, uh, are going to be with us for a long time, I suspect. Eamon, where do you sit on, on how this is playing out, I guess, in voter land more than anything else? Well, look, I think in voter land, that, that verdict's in, isn't it? Happened at the last federal election. There's a bunch of people sitting in the parliament called the Teals. They basically had climate number one on their agenda. Look at the electorates that they took. So regardless of what your position is, I think ultimately, just from a p political perspective, this is on the agenda. People are worried about it and they want action. Mm -hmm. Now, we can debate back and forth. Uh, you know, in terms of the causes, but as you pointed out, Tom, the trend is right there. I think that is beyond doubt. That's beyond any argument. And we all know that one of the... But the Teals aren't the whole country, though, and that's sort of the other... Sure. You know, there are seats out there that if you went too hard on climate, you'd lose them, wouldn't you? So is it... I guess... I... Do you feel like the balance has sort of permanently shifted, or is it still cyclical, the, the big concern on climate change, that big concern when it's happening, when it's not, people sort of forget about it and go, oh, what's happening with our power bills? I think that the I think opinion has shifted massively. I mean, don't forget, I worked for Gillard and Rudd. I was there for the whole Wyala thing. I mean, and the $100 uh, leg of lamb, I don't think you can get away with that now. You know, it's just it, people accept it as part of life. And the voter profiles moved. Yeah. And as younger uh, voters come in, they all accept that this is part of life and we've got to get onto it. Is that just ending on this briefly, David? Do you, do you agree on? Yeah, I, I on agree a with Eamon. What's happened if we chart it back over? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Eamon. Uh, you know, we're over that Rubicon. That that that's gone. Both major parties have got uh, policies to reduce emissions. The debate about is really about how far and how fast. And and as you okay. see, you know, played out in the papers today, how long we've got to uh, move to a new form of power that is is far more sustainable and how quickly and and what the cost increase associated with that's going to be so it's not that anyone's in the position of saying this is not happening it's 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 more of the debate about how do we deal with it in a way that that doesn't okay. penalize consumers and and is there a little bit of an issue there potentially for labor Eamon, on not being totally agnostic i mean nuclear doesn't seem to be the cheapest right now but it might be so if you're really going to to shut it out it might 
you know, cost either people or the climate? Is, is Labor too ideological on nuclear power? I think Labor came to the election with a very, very clear plan, and it's out there. And surely you owe it to the electorate and you owe it to yourselves to put your plan in place first, which is exactly what they're doing. No one ever spooked nuclear back then. The cost is a huge unknown. Even the estimates now, 370 plus billion now, you know, uh, to move to the extent that some people are talking about, God knows where we would end up. There is a plan in place now that is yeah. underway. We are looking at renewables and getting as much of that shift underway as possible. Um, and everywhere you see okay. investment, not just government investment, but also private investment is moving that way. David, interested in your, your views on the, the No campaign, really talking a lot about um, the fact that crosses are not counted as a no. There's even a legal case today which has failed. Is this just, you know, a lot of people just dip in and out of politics. Will there be people sort of picking up that a cross should mean no, therefore I'll do it, I'll show them, and this might be a bit of an own goal for the No campaign? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the AEC's come out and said it. this is consistent with previous practices, right? Um, I think what it shows is everyone's jockeying for position. No, no one's prepared to let the other, the other side of the, the debate get what they perceive to be a win. Um, you know, probably, <laughs> well, I, I think it's going to be a better, it, it's going to be a bigger indicator of, of where things go to get actually people out to vote as opposed to whether they use a cross or whatever. And as long as it's clearly marked at the at the ballot box, you, you, you're probably not going to have a problem with that. But it, it sort of shows the jockeying that's been leading up to this. Um, but the ACs, I think, made it very clear, haven't they, that, that, that they're just going with, with previous practice at, at referenda yes. and, and, and plebiscites. Yeah, that's more, I think, about 30 years or so. This is mm. what's happened through, through case law, effectively, in previous court rulings, Eamon. I'm not going to give you a go on that because we've just got a bit of breaking news coming in. Apologies, uh, um, but I think I know where you would have headed with that one anyway, if I might suggest it. Eamon, David, thank you.